And with that, I'd like to call on Jim McCarville. I didn't say much about Dr. Fagioli at the beginning because I knew Jim was going to be giving a great introduction. So over to you, Jim, to introduce our fine speaker for the evening. Thank you, Gretchen. Ecclesial Movements is the name uh, for the many volunteer groups and associations <coughs> that have arisen within the church. They're largely lay led uh, they, and they call attention to the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit. They offer the possibility of going beyond the boundaries, broaden the horizon of mission and ministry, but they also come with challenges. Many were formed before Vatican II, others after. The church has a process to officially recognize them and it requires they maintain some relationship with the diocesan hierarchy. But many new groups, including those that a lot of people in this room tonight belong to, are only beginning to emerge. They are emerging from a response to the sexual abuse crisis in the church, the shortage of priests, the crying desire of the laity to participate in rebuilding this church, and just maybe somewhere along the line to find out what Pope Benedict meant when he said the laity are co-responsible for this church. How do we fit in? Do we fit in? I can think of no better person to ask this question than Dr. Massimo Fagioli, church historian, a full professor in Villanova in theology and author. He writes for La Croix International, Commonweal and many other Catholic magazines. His books include The Rising Laity, Ecclesial Movements Since Vatican II, and Sorting Out Catholicism, A Brief History of the New Ecclesial Movements. But don't expect him to get stuck in the past. Dr. Fagioli was one of four non-Australians asked to help the Australian church and government sort out possible new directions for the church in that country. He comes here tonight to share his perspective on the church, where we're headed, and if I may challenge him to perhaps tell us, how do you think we fit in or do we fit in? Please raise your hands and join me in a warm Zoom welcome for Dr. Fagioli. See you, benvenuti. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, it is something that we started talking about, I believe, early 2020, when we didn't know in what way this year was going to unfold, but here we are. And so I'm very happy to speak with you tonight because I wrote two books on the new movements um, and it's, it, one of my experience has been that the, the reception of these books on the new movements um, has been uh, a bit particular. So it has raised interest in some groups uh, more than others. And so this is a, a welcome invitation. I started uh, doing research on the nuclear movements in the early 2000s, uh, when I had concluded uh, a 20 or almost 25 year long experience in the Italian Catholic uh, Boy Scout movement, which is the largest Catholic youth movement in Italy. And I wanted to understand more because uh, I had gone through very positive experiences in that group, but also I've encountered um, a few typical uh, shortcomings of the post-Vatican II lay ecclesial movement in the Catholic Church in Italy. So is it, started in the early 2000s, uh, still during the pontificate of John Paul II. And one of the most interesting exercises that I could uh, do in these last almost 20 years is to observe on the one hand, uh, how movements have adapted to different popes the different uh, theological languages and perspectives. And on the other hand, how popes have adapted to this phenomenon of movements that uh, is going to 
to remain part of the Catholic Church. There's no way that the Catholic Church can imagine itself in the future without the movement element, whether they are movement in name uh, or also in, in essence only without the name. So what I'm going to do tonight is this, it's divided in two parts. The first part, a, a little bit of uh, history of these movements and how they came about. Uh, are there faces that we can break down this, this history of this uh, 150 years more or less? And the second part will be a few raising questions on the role of movements today, on, on on their uh, position and role in the Catholic Church um, and in global Christianity also. So here, the uh, element of movement is in some sense new. So we start talking about Catholic movements in the late 19th century and then 20th century, but in other sense, movements in the church have always existed. Um, one way of reading the first chapter uh, of the first letter of St. Paul to, to, to the Corinthians is when St. Paul asked them, why are you so divided? Um, uh, so he already casts a light on the, on the problem of the existence of subgroups in a Christian community. So in some sense, the, the phenomenon of, of subgroups and of movements within the one church has always existed. And so we have movements uh, in the first millennium, the monastic movement, and then in the early second millennium, the, the new movements that in the end will bring about the, the, the Dominican order, the Franciscans, their movement that in the end they solidify themselves or they clericalize themselves, but it always starts as something that is in tension with the institution. So, so here, the, the classical perspective on movement is movement as opposed to the institution, which is about stability and movement is it's about creating something new that really doesn't fit with, with the institutional structure or language or expectations. So, I mean, they all have always existed, but there is a new way of understanding the phenomenon of movement that we can identify with the uh, late 19th century, or more precisely, if we, if we wanna I mean, find a way to celebrate the anniversary with the effects of the first Vatican Council, Vatican I, 1869, 1870, 2020 is the 150th anniversary of the, second, of, of, of the First Vatican Council, which is known mostly for the papal infallibility and papal primacy, but it's also a new way of the, of, of the church to understand itself in its relationship with modern society, modern state, the secular dimension. And so here, I think we can identify a first phase um, in the history, in the modern history of, uh, of, of the Catholic movements um, in those decades between Vatican I and World War I, more or less, that, that uh, 40 year, half a century. What's happening there? It's happening that the Catholic Church and especially the, the hierarchy realizes that it's impossible for the Catholic Church to reconquer and regain a prominent role in society and in politics directly as clergy, as popes, bishops, cardinals. I mean, they have lost the right 
of having uh, a vote as members of, of the clergy that can succeed the, the democratic vote. And so they understand in very indirect ways that they need the lay people to start a project of reconquista, of reconquering modern secularized society. And so that's why the lay people is activated in, in a top-down perspective. We need you to do what we know it's, it is necessary for the church to survive. In the secular society, the secular world, it's a very European perspective or Western perspective reacting against the French Revolution and liberalism, nationalism. And so it's, it's that phenomenon that is one aspect of the, of the, of the consequences of, uh, of the beginning of the modern tradition of social teaching of the church uh, that we can identify with, with uh, Pope Leo the Fertis Encyclical of 1891 Rerum Novarum, what is the role of the Catholic Church in modern capitalistic democratic society, in the economy, in the family, on the workplace, in culture. And so we need lay people that can start doing that formally by themselves, but always under the control of us, uh, bishops, cardinals, the Vatican. And so that is phase one, so where being a lay Catholic active in society, in a workers' unions, in, in a league, uh, as a business person, even in politics, is already an element of movement. Why? Because it was new and because it was not much of tradition before and it was, it, there wasn't any legal framework in, in which this new activity of lay people in their own name in modern secular society could be framed in the same exact way that other experiences before of the Dominicans, of the Franciscans, Jesuits had been an effective way of changing both society and the church. One important thing is that these movements of the uh, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, they are movements to change society, not to change the church. This is a very important distinction, right? So they are legitimately acting on behalf of the institutional church to produce change in modern society outside of the church. But there's no talk of lay people being corresponsible or uh, changing the church or, and even less reforming the church. This is something that is totally post conciliar post Vatican II. Okay, so this is phase one. Okay, it's, it's still very informal, no labels, uh, it's a very European experience that migrates in, in different fashions in North America and in Latin America, but it's still a, a very Western way of the church to react against uh, modernity. Second phase begins after World War I in the 1920s, which is uh, and lasts until Vatican II, so 1920s, late, late 50s. And it's the golden age of Catholic Union, of, of Catholic action, sorry, Catholic action. Why is this second, is, is the second phase different from the first one? It's different because for the first time, the papacy and on orders of the papacy, all bishops, they understand that they have activated an energy in the church that needs a certain degree of, uh, of formal structure. And so here Catholic Action is a big umbrella name 
that allows bishops and the clergy to retain control of these lay people that especially after World War I, so with um, capitalism, democracy, and states that are, are fighting against the attacks against democracy, like, like Italy or Germany or France or, or Spain, here Catholic action becomes one way that is at the same time theological, but also legal, canonical, to say, you lay people, you are doing a great job, but you need to be members of this thing called Catholic action. The ones in charge of Catholic action are the bishops at the national level, at, 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 at the local level, the one bishop, at your very local level, your parish priest. So it's a lay movement under the control of the hierarchy, but it is more formalized it's, it, it's a blueprint that in 1921, 22, the Vatican issues to all churches, basically, if you want to organize your lay people, that's the model you have to follow Catholic action. And so that's one difference. The second difference is this, is that uh, these lay Catholics are given also a task in some countries, especially, to create a, an ecclesial space that starts to work as um, a cradle of new leadership for the future society. That happens in Catholic action in France, in Germany, Italy, especially in that tragic period of European history between World War I and World War II fascism, Nazism, communism, civil wars, and so on. So here you have lay Catholics that are born at the beginning of the 20th century, and they are given a, a task implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly or secretly, you have to work for the future Italy, the future France, future Spain, future Germany, when the dictatorship will be defeated. So this is a much more political task. It's more political because they need formation, they need to organize themselves, and, and they need to, to get ready when these regimes will collapse, right? So this is what, it's how all uh, Christian democratic parties in Europe after 1945, they win all the elections in those first few years, it's this new generation of lay Catholics that have been directly or, or indirectly shaped, formed by Catholic action or similar movements that follow under that umbrella. And they become the new leadership of the post-war Europe. Now, without the Catholic Church knowing that, or maybe knowing that, but not acknowledging that, these lay Catholics in Catholic action that in the, 20, in, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, they start thinking about modern democracy, modern society, modern economy, and so on. Slowly, they start to think about also, also the future of the Catholic Church. And so they start acquiring an expertise, a wisdom, knowledge, networks, and a vocation to be lay Catholics, not just in charge of changing society outside of the church, but slowly they realize that it's also their vocation of lay Catholics to contribute to the change or reform of the church. And it's not a, a casual thought. I mean, all, all these Catholics have gone through two world wars, the interwar period, and Catholic bishops totally compromised in many countries with fascism, Nazism, Frankism. And so they understand that this Catholic Church needs a supplemental 
help of lay Catholics, not just to help society creating a more human economy, a more human social, uh, social system, but also a holier church, a less sinful church, a, a less politically stupid church, if, if, if you allow me this language. And as this was happens in all, uh, all Christian democratic parties in the 40s, 50s, and that is the, the second phase. So where Catholic action is really an enormously important uh, kitchen for the preparation of this new uh, uh, generation of leaders and, and, and of members that will rejuvenate I mean, European politics and also Catholicism at the same time. At some point, this experience becomes exhausted and it is replaced by a third phase in the history of the movements, which is something that starts between the late 50s and the 60s, Vatican II. Why this third phase? Well, because we have one thing that happens, which is it starts as slow and in the 60s, late 60s, not so slow, actually very, very uh, quick process of Catholic action losing a lot of its members, not only to secularization, but also because many of, of these members, they realize that they need a new experience of Catholic movement that is more uh, idiosyncratic, more driven by a special charism, a special vocation. And so that's why you have in the late 50s and, and then 60s, the beginning of these movements like, like communal liberation uh, and others that gather members that used to be members of Catholic action and say don't and so they don't break away because they're no longer Catholic, but they understand that the modern form of lay apostolate in, 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 in the Catholic Church needs also more independence from the institutional church. And so Catholic action is very hierarchical, very structured, Pope, bishops, parish priests. In this third phase, which in some cases begins a few years before Vatican II, in some cases after, allows and entails a much higher degree of independence for these new movements that are made of lay people, but also they are run by lay people. So they need some connection, link of obedience with the social church, but much, much thinner, much, much uh, less visible and much less intrusive. So you need to send a signal that you are in communion with your bishop, with the Pope, but not much else, usually. Okay, so this is the third phase, which is the really flourishing of this new experience, which uh, in the 60s and and the 70s gives uh, room to a number of new movements that go in different directions. So you have movements that are very focused on ecumenism, uh, on social issues. Um, you have movements that import in the Catholic Church the charismatic experience. It's the most important contribution of the United States to the history of the new Catholic movements. Uh, Notre Dame, 1967, and also Duquesne. Uh, so it's a very important contribution. It is 
a Catholicization of, 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 of an experience that originally was not Catholic, but it becomes Catholic. So many different directions. It's no longer Europe, but it becomes really global. And so this third phase is a very complicated one because one thing is to start a group of, of uh, people, I mean, claiming that they are a lay Catholic group and that they do Catholic things. It's, it's more difficult sometimes to have your bishop or your parish priest, and in some cases, even the Pope, to agree with you and to tell you, yes, you are doing Catholic stuff. You, you are a Catholic group. That is uh, a difficulty that most of these movements face. And you have that a great moment uh, of recognition of these new movements. It's between the end of the pontificate of Paul VI and especially John Paul II. So here John Paul II is the golden age of the Catholic movements because John Paul II realizes that in the Catholic Church, in this world, in the future, there's no room for a church that cannot rely on lay people. And so this church to survive needs lay people. And so here, John Paul II has a very liberal policy of acknowledgement of all Catholic movements that claim to be at the service of, 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 of the church and so on. Of course, John Paul II has a much more favorable approach to movements that are more conservative in their theologies, in their ecclesial politics, uh, and is much more cautious on other movements, like in Latin America, those that are sympathetic to liberation theology, so they cannot enjoy really the, uh, of, the of, of that liberal policy of the Vatican, uh, allowing groups to uh, uh, crop up uh, overnight sometimes and to be allowed to, uh, to, to present themselves as Catholic groups. And so this is a very long third phase, which uh, begins with Vatican II, and I believe ends uh, with the pontificate of Pope Benedict the 16th. Why do I say that it ends there? Because I think that with Francis, we have entered a different phase, so Francis uh, has inaugurated uh, a different policy towards the new movements in this sense. That Francis has kept all acknowledgements of all groups. He hasn't rescinded any, uh, any agreement and so on. But in every speech, every document, Francis has, has, has addressed to uh, the new movements, he has always cautioned them against very typical uh, problems that these groups can experience, like, like sectarianism or like an abuse of the charismatic authority. Uh, the feeling that you are the real church, and so in a certain sense of entitlement. Uh, so here Francis has been very, very courageous because he has said to the movements and things that no pope before him uh, had the courage. Uh, or there was, I mean, Paul the sixth, he had some doubts on the movements, but he realized that he was to, that he belonged to a previous generation of the thirties basically. And so in the end, he did not have that authority of judging all these movements made by the 20 year old people in, in the seventies. It was so, but here John Paul 
And Benedict, I believe they were sometimes really blind to some dynamics of these movements that have provided an incredible energy to the Catholic Church, but at the same time, so they have provided also some examples of how the Catholic experience can become sometimes sectarian or manipulative. Because here, Francis has said very clearly that uh, one danger of the movement experience in the Catholic Church is the danger of abusing of authority and of depriving members of their spiritual freedom. It's, it's, it's very strong language, which, which uh, I was very surprised when I read that, and I thought that there was something new. So here Francis has maintained all, all these groups, he's in very good terms with them, all of them, I mean, uh, Sant'Egidio, Communion Liberation, Focolare, I mean, even People of Praise. <laughs> so he's very, very on good terms with them, but um, as a Jesuit, uh, let me say that, he doesn't like to be lectured on charisms by anyone. So he has this courage of saying, look, I've gone through a spiritual experience in a community uh, a, which cost me as a Jesuit uh, marginalization and so on. So I know how, how destructive can be sometimes the experiences. And so this is a new phase, I believe, uh, so where movements still enjoy a high degree of appreciation from the papacy, no doubt about that, as the movements have become really strong allies of all, of all popes, all of them. They need each other, uh, no question about that. But at the same time, Francis uh, has injected in the Catholic experience on the movements a very necessary degree of caution and of awareness of some typical problems. And of the first part on the history, uh, which is, uh, is longer than the second part, so don't worry about that. So what are the, the emerging problems or, or, or issues that we should be aware of? Um, at 60 years from the Second Vatican Council. So here, uh, I told you about my way of, of, of dividing this, uh, this history in four moments, but there's another way that was brought up a few, a few, a few months ago by one of the best uh, uh, Italian theologians uh, and, and the most important advisor to, to the Focolare movement, Piero Coda, who in a, an important uh, lecture in, in Rome, he, he said, the history of the Catholic movements can be divided in three big chunks. I mean, part one, foundation and enthusiasm and new energy. Moment two is the effort to uh, solidify and institutionalize and uh, solidify th those foundations uh, in, the, in the church. Now, he said last year, we live in a third moment uh, in the life of these movements, which is at the same time, the change of generation from the founders to the second generation, which is always very problematic in all groups, in all movements. And at the same time, we have the emergence in a visible way of some problems in the movements that are experiences of crisis, uh, of people leaving movements, uh, and also of, uh, of, uh, of, of abuses sometimes, not always sexual abuses, but also spiritual abuses, abuses of authority. So this is, and I, and I repeat, he is a member of, of the Focolare, he's not an enemy of the movements, not at all, 
and he's a great theologian, so he knows what, what he's talking about, and, and I agree with him. So this is a particular moment in the life of the Catholic Church and of, uh, and of the movements um, in general. Why? Because we are in, in a period of deep institutional disruption not only in our politics, in our international order, in the US and the Brexit and the European Union and, and all that, but also in the church. Now, I know that there are some who think that this is the prelude to the beginning of a post-institutional Catholic church. I have doubts about that. I believe that the future of the Catholic Church will be a coexistence of institutional and non-institutional. In this, the movements have a lot to say because they have always been uh, on the threshold of a church that needed them but really didn't know where to put them, needed them, but really they didn't understand what these movements were. Are they Protestants? Are they sectarians? Uh, so what do they, do they want? So here movements, I believe, are an important place to understand what kind of coexistence there can be between institutional and non-institutional. So here, I think that this pandemic has opened our eyes. So here, I mean, all, all, all these uh, made at home liturgies uh, and, and so on can give sometimes the impression that we can do without the Catholic Church. Uh, it all works until you need a sacrament. Uh, if you don't have children, I, I have an eight-year-old that this spring had to receive First Communion and there was no alternative. There was no um, uh, Starbucks or McDonald's to go for, 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 for First Communion, right? So here there is an institutional element that will remain. At the same time, we are now in this moment and my experience with the, the working group in Australia has been exactly about that. How to imagine a church that retains as much institutional aspect as it needs, but it's open as much as it can to a non-institutional or new institutional way of, uh, of organizing itself. So why is this a moment of, of, of disruption? Well, there are so many uh, factors. One is that we are no longer in a church where uh, everyone remains and it's the secular. So here, this transition from the institutional to the non-institutional is made necessary by the fact that uh, we are no longer a, a church as big as it used to be. Movements have always uh, uh, thrived in these moments of uh, redefinition of who is a member of, of, of the church. And the challenge of our centuries, I mean, 19th century, 20th century, 21, is how to get out of the illusion of the Middle Ages into a new age where being a member of the church is a voluntary act, is your decision, it's not your parents' decision, it's, it's not your, your uh, owner decision is not your king's decision, it's your decision. And that naturally makes necessary a certain element of movement. I have to motivate myself, why am I a member? 
of, of, of research. There are other uh, factors that are more tragic. So here, the sex abuse crisis certainly is a major uh, factor of disruption. So here, if we have lost the appetite for an institutional church, it's also because it's decades now that we hear about the abuse crisis, uh, and it's it always seems to be starting again from zero. And so the element of movement can be seen in all these networks and advocacy groups. They are movements, they Catholic movements. Maybe they don't want to be Catholic uh, anymore, but they are movements for the change of the church. Uh, third, there is, and this is the most problematic uh, and more difficult to, to, to control probably, is that the major changes in the, in, the, in the information system, in the way we get information, has created a totally skewed picture of ecclesial identities. So here there's no longer the average Catholic. It all depends on what kind of uh, Catholic news you, you get and from where. And that really shapes your idea of what the church is or should be about, what's happening, who's doing things right. So here there is no possible separation between the new information ecosystem in our world and in the, in, in the church and the tendency in the church to create very idiosyncratic identities. And so here, if you want, we are one step further after the creation of the movements of the, of, of the 60s, 70s, because back then, at least, it was movements that you could experience in real life with real people uh, that you became friend with uh, for your life or for a long period of time. Now, you have some kind of movements in the church that are are based on virtual realities, on social network, on social media. These are new movements. Uh, so at the intellectual level, at, at the ecclesial level, there are big ideas or new experiences or agenda that are being pushed by groups that exist only on social media, but they are affected. They're affected. And so this is one more element of disruption because the ecclesial link between them and the church as such, I mean, bishops, non-bishops, but also other people in the church is basically non-existent. It is non-existent. So they are all ecclesial identities that behave as movements because they are very polemical against the bishops, the Vatican, the the Pope against uh, the theologians, but it's like um, it's, 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 it's like catching ghosts. It, it's, it's impossible to I mean, gather all these different movements in one big hall or in a basilica. It, it's impossible. And so this is part really of, 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 of the information system. Um, now, one final thought. The major problem that I see in this uh, further development of the movement is this, is that the big danger is that in the end, they could become the antithesis, the anthe antithesis of Catholicism, which means that they can become totally sectarian. If there's one 
one definition of Catholicism is the opposite of sectarianism. And so this is why I believe there is an element of warning that is worth considering when we talk about the necessity of movements, but at the same time, some dangers, which uh, I, I believe are present, especially in churches like this one that are very dominated by media, media narrative, social media. Uh, and this is, is the right, my experience in these last few years as a scholar that has started working on these movements of the 20th century and now sees a new version of them in the, in the uh, 21st century. Uh, I will stop here and I thank you for your, your patience and I'm waiting for instructions. Thank you so much. You have really given us a lot to think about um, with your comments. We've had a few questions that have come up. Um, and um, um, Okay, this one is from Joyce Rothermel. Uh, Dr. Fajoli, you speak about dangers or concerns, but what about opportunities and hopes in many ecclesial movements? Then from Michael, how important to Catholic movements do you see the young Catholic Christian workers, YCW, and young Catholic students, YCW, movements first in Belgium and then throughout the world? And then the third one, what practical suggestions do you have for progressive lay groups to reconcile and work with conservative clerics? Okay, and then we got one more from Sally Ryan. How can lay groups work effectively to dismantle clericalism? So I would start from the second one, which is the question where I, I don't have much to say because uh, I mean, the phenomenon of the kind of movements um, is really a galaxy of, of hundreds of, of different movements. So here, what this question refers to, I think is that uh, there is uh, a progression in the history of the Catholic movements that is in the 20th century European, and then they migrate and then they adapt locally. So all these movements, for example, that Pope Francis has always talked about in, in Latin America, and so they uh, apply there uh, the modus operandi of, of uh, the young Catholic uh, movement in Belgium, see, judge, act. Okay, so here, Catholic movements have inspired a number of, of things in the institutional church that we no longer recognize as coming from, from movements. And so here, it, it has become very hard to 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 distinguish what comes originally from a movement because it, much of what they have, have experienced and they've taught the church has become mainstream. Uh, the first question on the opportunities and hopes. So here I as I said, now, everyone who remains in the church, in some sense, it's because is committed to a certain way of being a movement Catholic. I mean, I, I don't know many Catholics who stay because of the bishops or, or <laughs> because of the clergy. I mean, they stay because they understand that they I see themselves engaged in a process of staying as something that is actually counterintuitive, right? Because it's so easy to live in disgust or because it's, 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 it's irrelevant, okay? So here, I do believe that there's no future in the Catholic Church without movement. No question about that. The problem is that we think, I think we need to 
understand Catholicism today as something that is made by movements with a label. Okay, so that is Sant'Egidio, Focolare, and, uh, and other ways of, of remaining or being in the church that need creativity and need energy and need courage and need uh, also some degree of, uh, of uh, risk taking. Okay, because this is, so the institutional system as it is, it's not, it's not sustainable. So uh, if this church survives, it's because of an element of, of new energies that are brought in from the outside of the clerical system. There's no question about that. The, the question, what suggestions do I have for progressive lay groups to reconcile and work with conservative clerics? This is a very difficult question. Um, in general, my policy is to engage and to use any opportunity to be at the table, not to, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm always worried when we tend to leave to the clergy or to uh, someone else the right to define what Catholicism is. And so this is where we are now, because what I see also in academia, I mean, Catholic theological academia, is a moment of retreat of liberal Catholics from ecclesial spaces. And those ecclesial spaces that are left empty are immediately occupied by those who are interested in, a, in the status quo or interested in a different kind of disruption. So here, I believe that those ecclesial spaces where we are, so we should remain there and occupy them in a different way, occupy, I mean, not militarily, but occupy in the sense of doing something. So here, uh, I, I had few experiences of exchange with uh, the clerics that didn't appreciate my theological work. And it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's really difficult and and I have no medicine that I, I can recommend. Uh, but my only urge is not to leave the table, not to leave the room, because that vacuum that is produced by Catholics that can no longer take it is not going to, to be there next year or in two years. It will be occupied immediately. And, and it, it's not that I mean that, I mean, we are right and, and the people are, are bad people and so on, but it's the physics of the Catholic Church. Uh, vacuum is occupied immediately. And so the church needs a certain balance of different voices and what has happened lately is that those who have gone through a, an experience of discouragement or frustration are inclined to leave and and this ha has created further imbalance in the physics of the Catholic Church between forces that have always been historically unbalanced, and now they're even more unbalanced. And so this is why we need more Catholics that are engaged and willing to fight for, for some change. Uh, uh, how can lay groups work effectively to this kind of clericalism? Um, I believe that in the long run, in the Catholic Church, there's no possibility to survive 
if it relies only on the clerical system. It may take uh, a longer time or shorter, but there's no long-term future for the church that is based on the clerical system. And so, the, so th this is something that the clergy know, I think. And so if I can say something, I mean, my impression is that the Catholic Church in the United States is still more clerical than other churches. It's more clerical than any other church that I've, I've experienced. And so I-, I So when you say that, are you meaning more clerical than other Catholic churches? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Other Catholic churches. Um, so here, I, in, in my life as a Catholic, in Europe, I mean, before coming here 12 years ago, I've never seen anyone uh, having a certain uh, uh, ideal model of the, of the clergy as I've seen here in US Catholicism. That has been shocking to me, honestly, that the clergy could really be seen as belonging to a separate world, I mean, almost cosmologically, I mean, it's some, uh, I mean, uh, of semi-gods or something like that. I've, I've never seen anything like that in Europe. And it's not because we are smarter or anything. It, it's just a, a recent history that is different. So here there is this need of the church in the United States, I believe, to become a bit less ideological, especially when it's about the system of power in the in the church, which uh, uh, is simply no sustainable, not sustainable in the long run, because it's a very big church with a smaller number of members of of of, of the clergy. So here there are theological uh, issues, who runs a parish, what is the model of the parish priest, a monarch or a coordinator and so on, but there's also a cultural issue. And uh, I, I wrote about the urgent need to overhaul the system of seminary formation which uh, is still aimed at, at creating priests uh, modeled after the ideal that was proposed by the Council of Trent, I mean, almost five centuries ago. And that is simply fantasy these days uh, or, or worse. Uh, so uh, that's what I would uh, say. So here, yes, I, I was reading from, from an outline and I can make it available, but it's no problem at all. Uh, I'm reading for, from, for, can I continue or? You're doing great, yes. Okay, great. Uh, is it possible for a movement to change the ills in the social church, uh, well, yes, for sure. So here, movements have an ability and agility to do things and say things that it's very hard for individual uh, lay Catholics or for, for the clergy to do. I mean, uh, I'll give you one example. So the work that in these last 35 years, the community of Sant'Egidio has done for the global church, beginning with the church in Rome and the papacy and the Vatican on issues like uh, ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, uh, dialogue with uh, Jews, Muslims, and in these last few years, 
uh, 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 but refugees has been unique. So they have literally taught the papacy how to do certain things, how to speak about uh, certain things. And so it takes smart people, active people that can devote their lives to a, a cause. It's not always easy, but this is the only way that uh, change can happen. And historically that has been how the church has changed uh, in the previous centuries, but also in these last few, few decades. I mean, all these theologians that were coming to, to Vatican II in 62 with the big ideas, I mean, they were thinking already about a new idea of, of, of lay people. Yves Congar wrote his most important book on the lay people in 54, and he was formally not a member of any movement, but he was part of a theological movement of enormous change in the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, the clerics here have the money and the property. Yes, there's no question about that. I would say that there's one more difficulty that in, in many churches, in this one in, in, included, money and property is in the hands also of lay Catholics whose hearts need to be convinced about the future of the church. And so this is not just a clerical problem. It is, it's a problem of a certain lay Catholicism that is not really in favor of some reforms, but it's in favor of some kind of status quo. So here it's important, this question, because we tend to, I mean, idealize lay Catholics. I mean, lay Catholics are by default in favor of change. They are anti-clerical. Well, not always. I mean, sometimes, I mean, lay Catholics are the best allies of the clerical system. And so this is really part of a church where lay people are more important. It means also they are more diverse. And so here, like, so there has to be a work of convincing of lay Catholics, especially Catholics that have deep pockets, they have connections. And it's my impression that in these last few years, a certain conservative Catholic agenda has been more effective in convincing wealthy, powerful Catholics uh, about a conservative agenda than a certain reformist agenda. So we need to get better, myself included, in building better connections with Catholics that have an interest in some changes for more corresponsibility of uh, the lay people and so on. Uh, can we push ourselves into a seat at the table? How? Uh, it all depends on local circumstances. Uh, legal avenues are really not the best avenue in the Catholic Church to fight for this. I mean, sometimes you can, but um, it's, it's about um, seizing the opportunity, a certain moment, uh, a certain... So my impression is that in the Catholic Church, um, the hierarchical structure is very much on the defensive. Uh, they don't have a great authority in public. A great, so they are really uh, incredibly weak weak hierarchy. And so I, I think that there's still a certain sense of entitlement sometimes or in some, in some circumstances, but nationally or even globally, 
the hierarchy of the Catholic Church has never been that weak, it seems to me. And so, and this weakness will continue for a long time. It's not something that will I mean, be over in the 2021. And so it, it's about how to find a way to present ourselves as credible actors for an ecclesial change that is sustainable. My recommendation is without me making uh, wild proclamations of uh, let's abolish this, let's abolish that, because this never helps uh, diplomatically. Okay, you, I mean, I try to be, as Kevin has written effectively about me, I'll, I'll, I'll use that. I, I'm a diplomatic fighter, right? So I fight for what I, I think is important, but I try to, um, to have a fundamental consensus uh, about what we're fighting for with those who don't agree with me. Uh, and that's not always easy. It can be frustrating, but there's no way out of that table, of that room, of that space, which is in the church. Because a very dangerous temptation is, the, is that dream that we can build a new church, a better church outside. It's never gonna work. So you can, we can, build a better movement, a better group, and so on, which ultimately, though, has to be in connection with the one church. Because otherwise, the whole idea of being a Catholic movement, I believe, meets its end. Okay, Because once you give up the idea that you want to fight for, for the reform, of the one church that, so here I'm gonna be very honest. One has to make the decision. I mean, do I believe that this church can be reformed or not? And I wonder myself sometimes. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm not hiding from you that my experience of working for that task force in Australia has been incredibly interesting, incredibly enriching, but also very frustrating. And sometimes it made me wonder, is this thing possible, right? And in the end, I still believe that, but it's a fundamental decision that a lay Catholic that wants to change things in a group, in a movement, in an association, has to be clear about, I mean, do I want to fight for the reform of the one church, or do I want to start something totally new? That's, that's, um, it's an available avenue, and my choice is to fight for the one church. Um, and it's, it's always been frustrating in church history to make changes. Um, but again, I believe this is a moment of opportunity, not because, also because of the weakness of the hierarchy, but also because there is a church today in 2020, and especially since Pope Francis came, where in the church there is a freedom to talk about things that cannot be taken for granted. I mean, you remember, I remember what it was to uh, talk about some issues under John Paul II or Benedict, women in the church, lay people and so on. Everyone had to be very careful. Right now, this is a, a church where a few issues have become mainstream. I mean, finally, <laughs> finally, right? 
Uh, so, so to that to that point, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but to you know to wrap up your your closing comments, I'm wondering we've had a, a question or a comment about Fratelli Tutti. We've had a comment also about is there any place at the table for women? And you started speaking about that. And would yeah, so I may be so bold? Would you want to maybe close out your comments to address one or the other of those topics or sure. something so, else? I believe that in this pontificate we see limits in Pope Francis' sensibility on the role of women in the church. So there's no question about that. At the same time, it's undeniable that in the global Catholic Church, the issue of the role of women in the church has become mainstream. And there's no way that one can imagine that this issue will go back into the bottle. So this yeah. is going to remain. And it's something that a few years ago was not easy to imagine this, right? So it's real now. And it's an important sign of hope that things have changed. And so maybe it will take some more time to have women deacons. I, I'm in favor of that. I, I've always said that, but I don't believe that the church will be able to ignore this issue for a long time. Agreed. So, with that, I think we've come to the end of the of the regularly scheduled session, let's say. And I would like to really profoundly thank Massimo Fagioli for his for his hope um, and for his motivation to join him as diplomatic fighters. I think that's a, a key phrase that comes out of this evening. So if we could all join in a round of applause for, uh, for Massimo. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to invite Betsy to, to say our closing prayer for us. Thank you, Gretchen. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals or objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that's the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Amen. 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 Thank you, Betsy. Amen. 